Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Hey everyone and welcome to our live class. We're so excited to have you here today and we're looking forward to a great lecture. My name is Anthony, I'll be your host. I'm joined on the line by Greer McGinnis. She'll be conducting the presentation today and I'm gonna pass it off to her momentarily to kick off today's topic, which is root cause testing for mycotoxins, heavy metals, and environmental toxins. So this is gonna be a great lecture. I know that we're all excited for this one. Before we begin though, I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items. Everyone is muted by default. And secondly, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them into the chat panel. The questions will come to me as the host and I'll be conducting a live question and answer with Greer at the end of today's presentation. And lastly, at the end of today's live class today, Adrian Martinez, who is Rupa Health's Head of Practitioner Partnerships, is going to be doing a live demonstration. So for those of you who are new to Rupa Health, feel free to stick around if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how we can help you optimize your practice. And for those of you who already use Rupa Health, thank you so much. And if you need to get back to your practice or day at that point in time, free to hop off. So I now like to hand it off to Greer to begin the presentation. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. My name is Greer McGinnis. I am one of the lab educators for Vibrant Wellness, and we are here today to talk about the root, root cause testing on our total tox bundle panel, which is the heavy metals, mycotoxins, and environmental toxins. <clears throat> So as I said, my name is Greer McGinnis. Um, I am a registered dietitian by trade. I'm also a certified detox specialist. I have some special areas of interest that I focus on, um, one being autism and ADHD. I also love anything about detox um, and I do anything with GI, gut health and immune response. So if you ever are joining us in, in Vibrant and running some tests and you have some questions, please feel free to um, book an appointment with us at any time, especially me. And I'll be happy to go over your labs and help you out as best I can. So we are going to dive into today's agenda. So this is why we're going to be talking about the importance of mycotoxin, heavy metal, and environmental toxin, and why we need to be testing these with our patients. We're going to be talking about the toxic load and the critical steps in the healing process. So we have everybody here from doing all different types of patient care. So we need to kind of, you know, elaborate a little bit more on why we're doing these testing and how it could be applicable to you and your patients. We're going to kind of dive in a little bit on why we should be testing them together, a little bit on how to interpret the test results and what we're kind of looking for when we're doing the testing, and then other types of labs to um, consider with testing to see if there are something else that might complement the total tox bundle panel, not just, you know, doing it on its own. Environmental toxins are mostly invisible. We, they are very undetectable. We don't really know that we're coming in contact with them until it's too late. So environmental toxin in definition form is about is substances and organisms that are negatively af uh, affect the health. They include poisonous chemicals, chemical compounds, physical materials um, that disrupt the biological process and organisms that we call diseases. The effects of these exposures to the environmental toxins are countless. Again, we don't see them. We don't know we're coming in contact with them until something unfortunately happens to us health-wise. And then when we start diving deeper, we actually see that we have these exposures and we have come in contact with these particular toxins and now they are causing a problem to our health. Since we don't see them, we really don't realize how many toxins we're actually coming in contact with. And, and it's shocking, but we actually come in contact with over 700,000 toxins per day, which is kind of mind blowing when you think about your day and how, you know, what you're involved in and what we're actually, it's, it's unavoidable. This is completely unavoidable. Over 700,000 toxins per day we're coming in contact with. And that could be anything from the water and food that we consume, our household, um, any air toxins or any type of mycotoxins that are in our environment. 
not all of these toxins are created equal. And there are sometimes that some of these toxins are what we call the worst offenders are ones that are actually impacting our health a lot more than we actually realize. So it is important to understand that we will come in contact with these types of toxins and we need to be equipped and prepared to deal with them and our bodies. We do absorb toxins in many different ways. And I don't think people realize how much sometimes what we what happens is we call it bioaccumulation. We actually accumulate toxins at a higher rate than our excretion rate. And it starts as early as in utero. So the EWG.org actually found um, 280 different types of chemicals in core blood. Um, so kids get he a huge dose um, just, you know, right before they actually are born into this world. And that could be anything from heavy metals to gasolines to pesticides. Um, so there is a lot of toxic load that already comes into a, a person's life just starting as a newborn, especially now a lot more toxins are coming into contact with kids more so now than ever before. Um, ingestion, so anything that the water and the food that we consume, um, inhalation, if you have paint fumes, burning coal, um, anything that we're actually inhaling on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on our location, we might be inhaling things a little bit more than others. Um, absorption through the skin. So especially little kids when they're playing on the grass or we're um, absorbing things like lotions, things like that, we'll definitely absorb things through the skin, touching like our iPods and AirPods and, you know, cell phones and things like that. They all contain chemicals, heavy metals and other type of metabolites. So we will be absorbing them through our skin just as much as we will inhale and ingest them as well. So we definitely have this bioaccumulation effect. And with bioaccumulation, it can honestly be something as something quick, you know, it, this could be a five to 10 year exposure. And all of a sudden we, sh we could start developing some chronic illnesses and diseases. And then there's other times that these exposures, chronic exposures can take decades to actually come about. So everybody is completely different, but these are just some of the uh, ailments and diseases that people can develop that has research to support that, you know, with that chronic exposure, this could actually come about. And that could be anything from cancer to cognitive delay, autism, autism, um, autism asthma, allergies, uh, anything, infertility, obesity, mitochondrial dysfunction. I see this a lot in the kids that I work with. So just because their exposure and theirs is more of a smaller dose of exposure for a smaller period of time, maybe less than five years, maybe even less than three years. Um, and then other times people when they're older don't actually start developing the diseases until later on in life. So it really just depends again, from start from utero, utero and on that bioaccumulation. So the big question is why are some people so much more susceptible than other people? Why, why is it that certain generations are better than others? And it does kind of stem back from this bioaccumulation. Now our bodies are these amazing well-oiled machines that we, we have, it can, it can tolerate toxins. They're meant to tolerate toxins, but typically at small dosages, we're not really supposed to have these large quantities of chronic exposure on our immune system. So when we start breaking down the system and unfortunately we are becoming more toxic in our society, the bucket starts to fill. And that's my analogy for this, where the bucket is what is filling of the human body and eventually the bucket can tip over. So many different types of issues and risk factors can come about and that's what can overfill the bucket. And it starts just the simple biological processes of, of those influential factors. It could be age, young kids versus older adults. It could be gender, male versus female and hormones, diet, eat, you know, fast food, poor nutrition, genetics and epigenetics, you know, patients with your MTHFR or glutathione um, SNPs that can't methylate, can't detox, can't produce enough glutathione properly. 
environment stress and just normal body function if things aren't working. And then of course you have other things like antibiotic use, frequent NSAIDs, food sensitivities, like every, all these things start filling your bucket and then eventually your bucket just unfortunately does overflow. And you have this perfect storm of toxic load on your individuals that will lead into some type of chronic disease or ailment. So since we have so many people here doing so many different things with patients, maybe gut health, um, hormones, um, dealing with uh, autoimmune diseases, I kind of wanted to dive in just a little bit on what these toxins can do and how do they disrupt the system where you might have those patients that you, you are working so hard on helping them heal and you might get it to about 70, 80%, but you just can't take them the full distance. Why is that? What is preventing them from getting to that point? What is stopping them? And a lot of times that can actually be environmental toxins and we just don't even realize it. So I just wanted to quickly kind of review a couple different areas that we all kind of work on probably with patients and one being the gut. Okay. Um, gut health is so important. And we know that it's the driving force. It's the engine to the car. It's, it's how the whole system works. You know, if the engine isn't working, the gut's not working, then nothing else is going to work. So we have these environmental toxins that can really damage the gut. And it, it might just be because of the fact that they have a shorter half-life, you know, not just in the environment, but in our bodies. So they can continuously do damage over time more and more. Um, but they lead to so many other things, especially when you're damaging the gut. So for instance, with heavy metals and the microbiome. So anything that is damaging or any type of toxin to the microbiome, one starts increasing oxidative stress. And we know oxidative stress, especially elevated oxidative stress leads to chronic inflammation. So that you're going to def, then that's where that trickle down effect, the food sensitivities and everything else starts coming into play because you have that damage to the gut and that inflammation. It also things like heavy metals actually de decrease our, our, probi our protective microbes. So things like short chain fatty acids that we need to feed our body actually get very much depleted. Heavy metals can also actually decrease our beneficial probiotic organ microbe organism. So that is the dangerous aspect to it. So not just heavy metals, but pesticides, phthalates, things like that also disrupt the microbiome. And that's where we start having now more of a trickle down effect, almost like a snowball effect. If you have depleted good probiotics, which I see over and over and over again, that actually prevents you from dealing with the toxins appropriately. So for instance, lactobacillus plantarum and lactobacillus rhamnosus, they actually are beneficial microbes that help neutralize heavy metals. They actually prevent them from being as toxic and the, as they are in the system. So if you have beneficial probiotics that are low, you actually can't neutralize heavy metals to be excreted properly and safely. So then they're actually at a heightened toxicity still circulating the system. So if you're disrupting the gut and any of these heavy metals, um, pesticides, anything else is disrupting the microbiome, you're going to have a very difficult time healing the system as a whole. And for those of you who work with, you know, the hormones, PCOS patients, endometriosis, weight loss, infertility on both male and female, the endocrine disruptors are a huge piece of this. And I see this a lot. And I'm really happy that I get to work with a lot of amazing practitioners who work in this space and run this test, um, especially with the environmental toxins for these specific endocrine disruptors. So endocrine disruptors are chemicals that interfere with normal function of the endocrine system, the reproductive and or the biological processes of the system. So things like, say, for instance, BPA, and I'm sure we all know about BPA. Every time you pick up something plastic, it has a nice little sticker on it, it says BPA free. 
because we know from the research that BPA actually can interfere with hormones and it actually, and it is an endocrine disruptor. So it has a lot of information out there. It's in the limelight. We know about it. So what they started doing is they started pulling back on the BPA, putting labels on everything to make you feel better. But then what they started doing was using uh, bisphenols, which are actually just as toxic and problematic. So in essence, if it is plastic, put it back on the shelf, whether it says BPA free or not, because it's probably made with a different type of plastic that unfortunately will still do the same thing. And it just, the science will probably eventually catch up with that. So anytime you're dealing with the, your endocrine disruptors and things like, you know, and I, and I have consulted a lot with vibrant with PCOS patients, you know, um, endocrine disruptors are the pathogenesis of, of, of endo of PCOS. So it interferes with the uh, obesity and the insulin resistance. So this is really a big key part that sometimes you just really need this last bit of the puzzle to kind of make your patient complete. And actually it'll help regulate their hormones and their body a lot more than just, you know, with whatever you're doing, it's just a nice compliment. It helps put all those pieces together and just makes it smooth sailing for them. And I've seen this before and it's really such a nice thing to kind of um, watch progress. With mold and mycotoxins, um, this is one of my other favorite things that I love to kind of consult on and talk about. And I have a personal experience that I'm gonna share with you guys in my lab anyways, but um, you know, molds produce uh, metabolites such as mycotoxin, they shred antigenic uh, materials such as spores, hypha, extracellular polysaccharides, and enzymes um, that are very toxic and cause immuno, um, immunological responses. So anytime you're dealing with the immune system, so it is not only impacting cytokine reaction, it can cause that elevated inflammation, it can cause that antibody response with the immunoglobulins, your IgG, your IgA, your IgM it can definitely heighten that immune response. And then you have this systemic inflammation and you just can't drive that down and you can't figure out why somebody is constantly having an immune system response. Um, so, you know, if the, a person has Lyme, Hashimoto's, anything like that, molds a lot of the time goes hand in hand with that. Um, and it just kind of creates this perfect storm of the cytokine inflammatory response. And it just makes the patient feel like they're chronically sick all the time and they just can't shake whatever is going on. Many times, most mold cases that you'll probably see are people who complain about allergic rhinitis or, you know, and they get misdiagnosed as allergic rhinitis, you know, the running nose, the cold symptoms, the watery eyes, but it's actually probably mold. And we just never really realize that. And I've, and I've talked to some practitioners um, with Vibrant that dealt with their own mold illness. One um, last week, she said she had chronic pain in her back. And that was like her first key note that, that something was really wrong with this immense radiating pain down her back. And then she started putting all those pieces together, ran a mycotoxin test and found a ton of black mold in her system. And once she started healing from that, she said everything else, her Hashimoto's, everything started feeling better and better and better. And that's, I think that's what's really important is putting those pieces of the puzzle together because sometimes we just don't think about those extra sources um, that are going on. So why do we really test together? So with the vibrant mycotoxin total tox bundle panel, we test for over 90 toxins. That's a lot of toxins to test and identify for somebody. Everybody is different. Not everyone's going to have the same symptoms. You can have five people in a house all exposed to the same type of mold and all five have completely different symptoms. So again, we always say tests don't guess because sometimes these symptoms kind of overlap a little bit and they might need, you know, you just need to know what you're kind of up against. And there are times where I've tested patients and I'm like, I guarantee you they have mold and they come back, no mold, but a ton of environmental toxins. I'm like, all right, well that, you know, just from signs and symptoms, it does, they don't always go hand in hand for that particular patient. So where their residential history is from, if they are a, on, living on a farm, if they are in an industrial area, if they are in a high toxic area, that would definitely, you know, we would definitely want to know what kind of environmental toxins we're up against. 
um, toxins can influence other toxins. And we kind of talked about this a little bit before where I said, if they inter, if they interact with the gut and they start depleting all these beneficial things, now you're opened up and more susceptible for other toxins, because that is basically our, our body's job is to get rid of toxins. And if we can't get rid of the toxins, we're going to eventually continue to bioaccumulate and add more toxins to the, to the already burdened body. And then toxic burden can actually inhibit the healing protocol. So there's so many times where I've worked with patients and they just can't get, like they're, we're missing something. We're missing that last piece of the puzzle be, to, to take them to that next step. Um, and, or we can't even get to the next step because nothing is working. I've worked with tons of kids who just have so many different layers of immunological issues that we have to start breaking it down. And sometimes we have to rule things out as much as we're ruling things in just to kind of get a glimpse of what is actually going on with that particular person. And what are those trigger factors for that particular person? So that's why we test them all together. It makes it a lot easier. And we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics uh, briefly is the heavy metal testing. Um, again, one of my favorite topics. And the reason why I feel like this is one, it's very near and dear to me, um, but also it's overlooked. And as we are growing as a society and we're evolutionary changing, we are becoming more toxic and we, uh, we are, you know, heavy metals are a naturally occurring process in the earth, but we're adding things and we're kind of playing with, you know, the game a little bit and we're adding more things than we shouldn't. So I think a lot of the times heavy metals are overlooked because we wouldn't actually really think that they can cause as much damage as they do, or that we really aren't holding on to them. Heavy metals don't free float in the system. They hide, they hide in our brain. They hide in our muscles and our tendons and our tissues and our organs. And that's why they can create all these different types of issues, anything neurological, respiratory, cardiovascular, GI, reproductive, renal, dermatitis, skeletal. I, I've seen a lot of patients with PCOS and infertility because of heavy metals. Um, so again, there are just so many, because they're not you know, free floating in the system and they hide in our organs and they can just basically what I call like hunker down and they just kind of hang out there, they can start causing a lot of damage. And then that's where things build up. And then we just assume that it could be something else when in fact, it's actually heavy metals. Every so often we see heavy metals in the news or, you know, and they get kind of like a, they get a bad rap, of course, you know, we, uh, I'm sure everyone's heard um, the latest with heavy metals in juices and baby food and things like that. Well, it's not just those items. I mean, our soil and where those foods are coming from first off is contaminated with heavy metal. So then eventually, you know, obviously baby's getting a large dose. We're getting the dosage just because of where the food is essentially coming from. Um, they did do a study where they found 168 baby foods made from 61 different brands companies had actually over 95 different type of toxic heavy metals in them. So whether it be maybe from the plants, um, from what they're pulling, the, the, where their, the crops are coming from, and then the facility, kids will always get these very large dosages of heavy metals early on in life. And then we also have other types of heavy metals that can impact the system. And, you know, this is just a nice little glimpse of what heavy metals can do to the system and how it could be interconnected. So again, heavy metals for me is just something that I really enjoy, you know, doing and looking at. Um, this is actually a patient of mine. Um, this is a seven-year-old little girl who has um, level two autism. Uh, mom came to me, we did run a battery of tests and I couldn't believe when I saw her heavy metal test come back. On the right-hand side, this was when we first tested back in April. Um, you can see she is just, she just had a ton of heavy metals in her system. Her gut was a mess. She had, you know, everything else seemed to be okay. She, I don't, she didn't really have mold. Her environmental toxins were not bad, but she had a ton of, of heavy metals. 
So we um, were at the point where mom was ready to retest. And, you know, I'm very happy with the progress that she has made. Um, we are not done yet. It's not even been a full year. Um, we just wanted to test and see where we are at. But I absolutely love how these testings can really show how the progress has made. She's doing so much better. She's um, calmer. She's talking more. She can interact more. Her receptive language is better. So again, heavy metals, especially in kids is always like my number one thing to always test for just because I want to see where we're at, what we're dealing with. You know, I get people that, you know, send me emails. They're like, I need to detox heavy metals. And I'm like, okay, great. What heavy metal are we wanting to detox? And they're like, I don't know. Well, we need to know because not all these heavy metals detox the same way. Um, not all the chelation is the same. So we really need to know what we're dealing with in order to be able to detox effectively. Um, mycotoxins. So mycotoxins are that very much invisible uh, thing that we really never see that can wreak havoc and cause so many issues. So molds produce secondary metabolites that produce toxins, which is called mycotoxins. Okay. Mycotoxins are hidden. We really will not see them. Their spore, their size is anything from about a 0.1 to a 20 micron. Um, so if you want comparison, that's basically anything that you can inhale, uh, like a smog, um, clouds and, um, fog is basically the, the smaller end of those microns. So if you're walking through fog and breathing that in, it's basically the same as a mycotoxin. And then it could go up and it'd be as big as bacteria and pollen. And that is something that you can easily inhale, goes right into the lungs and then right into the bloodstream. A lot of the times it's going to hunker down and find your fat cells. And then, you know, you will eventually get, if you build, if it builds up enough, you will get uh, mycotoxin uh, illness or, or mold illness. So mold illness can be a battery of different things between, I see a lot of chronic fatigue and weakness, loss of balance, skin rashes, uh, depression, uh, stiff joints, muscle pain, muscle weakness, sleep problems. So mold is not anything that I take lightly. I deal with mold head on because it is a very detrimental issue to the body. And we, there are two different types of, um, classes here, two different types of sources. So we do have food related mold and we have environmental related mold. And this is really the first step into identifying where you need to focus your energy, because the first step in any type of mold illness is to, um, separate yourself from where you're, where you are. So if it is an environment, we need to remove you from that environment. If it's food, we need to really do a, um, food log and kind of identify where maybe that those food sources are coming from. So, and I'm sure many of us actually probably hear more about black mold or, you know, mold from a house versus food mold, but food mold can be just as dangerous, just as, um, uh, impactful to the human body. Um, many of our testing, we will get a nice little summary page here to actually show you uh, at a small glimpse what you're up against, whether it be your highs, so that'll be in the red, and then your moderates, which are, will be in your yellow. So quickly, you can kind of gauge what you need to work on with your patient. Do you need to focus on environment quickly? You need to call them and say, hey, listen, you have mold in your home, maybe, or a workplace, or is it they, it's a food related and we need to sit down and really go over this. So it's a nice little glimpse to kind of see what you're up against and maybe further testing might be warranted for your patient. Aflatoxin tends to be one of the more common food related mold that I see. This comes from different strains of aspergillus. Many times it's in our crops, our cereals, our oil seeds, tree nuts and spices. And everyone always forgets about the spices, but spices are a huge mold because I'm sure if we looked in our spice cabinet, we would go, man, that was expired about two years ago. <laughs> and it happens to the best of us. So yeah, if you know, those types of things breed mold, unfortunately. So many times it's just looking at those small little pieces of the puzzle to kind of put together again. Um, we just usually don't identify, we have to identify that food mold so that if it's food mold, 
we need to know where it's coming from, if it's dairy or indirect. Um, many times I've seen this with indirect markers. So if a, say for instance, a cow eats the grains on a farm that is contain that contains mold, and then we milk that cow or we eat that cow, then we are taking that mold that they had consumed and we are getting it indirectly as well. So it is, you know, firsthand getting it ingestion and then secondhand through, you know, a third party getting it. So aflatoxin is one of like a big one. So this is my test results and I wish, <laughs> I wish it was better than what it was, but um, one of the ones at the bottom, this is tadoglobulin A, this comes from chadmium globulin, which is a fungus from water damaged buildings. And the reason why I did this is because I knew that I was exposed to mold in a water damaged building. I worked in a facility for four years on the first floor that when I would walk into my office, it would just, I, I would walk into just water. And I'm not even talking about like little drips. I'm talking about bucketfuls of just, I, one of those big brown, you know, grayish garbage cans, just collecting water that was just pouring from the second floor into our office. So I knew, you know, I would go in one day, I wouldn't see mold. The next day I'd go in and the, um, the mold tiles would just be everywhere. So I knew I was um, in contact with mold. I knew I was breathing it in and I was constantly sneezing. I constantly had respiratory issues, um, sneezing, runny nose, watery eyes, you know, and everyone would joke, you know, they're like, oh, if you ever leave, I wonder if you'll stop sneezing. Well, I did. So once I left that building, I stopped sneezing and I stopped having a lot of my respiratory and breathing issues. And I've been working on decreasing, you know, this level ever since then. So again, first step is to definitely remove. And one of the, the scary things about this particular uh, tetoglobulin A is that even at low, low levels of this compound, it can actually be very lethal to various tissue um, culture cell lines and promote death. So would cell death. So it, it, is not a toxin that we want to um, be in contact with. And it's not something that we want to mess around with. So definitely been on, you know, a regimen and detoxing and getting that out of my system. Cause that was pretty scary. The trichothecene section is basically, and the stachybotrys is your black mold. Now around scary thought, 70% of homes actually have mold. Okay. And it, depending on your climate, depending on where you are, but around 70% of homes actually have mold in them. So everyone probably at one point in time in their life has been exposed to some type of mold. These stacky botrys on the bottom is your black mold or your toxic mold, which can cause lethal, lethal issues to a person. So we definitely want to identify where that person's been, if they're still in that mold environment and get them out of it or try to figure out a way, like maybe it is an office building, maybe it is a home, maybe it was grandma and grandpa's house that they spent a couple of years at a few years ago. Unfortunately, mold can kind of linger and hunker down for a while. It's not just, you know, this is only for six months. This is, you know, it can actually stay in our system for quite some time. So again, we definitely want to address whatever that person is coming in contact with as soon as possible. Um, lastly, we're going to be kind of, we're going to be talking about our environmental toxins, which I really do enjoy the environmental toxin parts. With environmental toxins, and, and I know I said we come in contact with about 700,000 different types of environmental toxins per year, that actually works out to be about 255 billion toxins per year that we are actually coming in contact with. So that is a lot of toxins. And I know that there are many people who really try to lead a very clean, healthy lifestyle. And there are sometimes that things just slip through the cracks. We don't realize it. These could be past exposures to um, from years of using other types of um, products. Um, so again, if you look at a lot of these symptoms, they very much mimic mold. So it is kind of hard to differentiate. Is it mold? Is it environmental toxins? Could it be a little bit of heavy metals? So again, test, don't guess, make sure you know what we're up against because then we know how we can avoid that particular toxin. 
the home is kind of where we start or where I especially start with patients. I say, okay, we need to go top to bottom and we just kind of have a checklist. Let's start looking at all the things that we come in contact with in our home and see where we start. The in-home air actually is about two to five times more toxic than outdoor air. So indoor air, you know, um, it is because it's stagnant. There's really no circulation. So it could be winter time. I love opening up the windows. Let's get all that air out. Let's circulate that air. Um, definitely let's get, you know, things moving. Let's look at all of our products that we're using, our cleaning products, what we're cooking in, what we're using, all of those things matter. And I know it might sound trivial, but again, Sometimes depending on your risk factors, it could be a small exposure to a large exposure and that is what creates that toxic load. So it's definitely looking at everything as a whole and kind of seeing where we need to go. But again, the home, usually the best way to kind of start your, your process when you're trying to have somebody have a better lifestyle. Again, you will get a summary page with the environmental toxins so you can quickly look. A lot of the times when I see very high numbers and I see a lot of people that have a lot of red, it tells me a couple of things. One, they're not filtrating, they're not detoxing properly. And two, they're either still coming in contact with these exposures um, or they're just really having trouble getting rid of them after they've bioaccumulated them for a, a period of time. So it actually helps me narrow down, okay, let's go through, you know, glyphosate, the methylparabens, the uh, BPA, let's work on these particular things because we know don't cook with plastic wear, get rid of plastic bottles. Um, are you using sprays and pesticides, things like that. So it's important to kind of start that running list and see where you need to start working with your patient. <clears throat> pesticides. I see a ton. And that's just because we use pesticides. Um, it's very hard to get products that are pesticide free. Unfortunately, it's everywhere. Um, this is actually a patient of mine on the top left corner. You'll see DDA. DDA is actually a metabolite of DDT. So DDT pesticide hasn't been used since the 1970s. And it was very toxic, very lethal. They've, ton, they've done countless studies and found a ton of uh, really horrible effects from being sprayed back in the day with it. So it's like, so this is a, this was a seven-year-old that most recently tested for it. So obviously we don't use DDT anymore. So how is this kid getting it? Unfortunately, it comes from utero and breastfeeding. So at his grandmother passed it to his mom and his mom passed it to him. So that is that genetic um, variation, that line that can actually transfer, transfer more toxins and so on and so forth. And with DDT, it, you, it's, it, when I looked it up, it said it does have a short half-life and, and that's clearly not true. Um, because I still think that there is soil being tested for DD, DDT, um, kids are, and people are still testing positive. This isn't just the first one I've seen. I've seen several of them. Um, so yeah, so people are still coming into contact with a ton of pesticides, but you know, and DDT can definitely be one of them. When we talked about those endocrine disruptors, and I'm sure, you know, everyone, you know, if you're a hormone expert and love the hormones, then that's definitely something that you want to look into because things like parabens and phthalates and things like that um, are very common. Parabens are in 90% of grocery items. They have at least a measurable amount of parabens in about 90 different types of, or 90% of grocery items. So they're still out there. They're, they still are used. They're still very much alive and well. And it's because of the fact that they're an antimicrobial and they also preserve the product. So I know people actually don't think so, but makeup actually has expiration dates on them and there's for a reason. So when we're looking at parabens, these are like your hair care products, your face products, lotions, makeups, et cetera. So they can mimic estrogen by binding to estrogen receptors on the cell, which actually increase cell division. And that's where you get tumor growth. So when we're looking at parabens and phthalates, 
especially if I'm working with someone with hormone issues or hormone imbalance, PCOS, I'm looking at these particular ones because I want to see if they're being exposed or if they've been exposed and how we can knock down this level because this is definitely going to impact their hormones. And you will actually see, and I've seen this where once you've kind of detoxed them, once you've gotten these out, you will see them actually improve hormone wise, even if they do a salivary hormone or a urinary hormone test, they've actually improved in their hormone regulation, which is really great to see even their menstrual cycles, et cetera. So um, one, some of these, especially the um, alkaphenol uh, metabolites with toxins, you know, we talked about half-life and some toxins actually can become less toxic over time and things like alkaphenols actually become more toxic over time. So they actually increase toxicity because they become more stable and persistent and, hydropho and, as, um, and hydrophobic leading to accumulation in any type of sewage and the air and the water. So we still use a lot of these products as emulsifying agents in our household cleaning products, detergents, adhesives. So we are coming in contact, we, we, we buy these products and they might even say that they're clean, they're, they're organic. And a lot of the times you have to actually read the labels to see that a lot of the times that they're not, they actually contain a lot of these chemicals. Um, because they actually will eventually accumulate in the fat and the adipose tissue. They can impact the nervous system, the immune system, and they can have a profound effect on the endocrine system as well and, and be an endocrine disruptor. So I would definitely, if again, if you are working with hormones or you know weight loss, insulin resistance, you really do need to focus on these endocrine disruptors because they really do wreak havoc on the system. And you will be shocked at what you can see when you start actually detoxing these types of things out of the system. So that is pretty much the total tox bundle panel. Um, there are other tests that I do strongly recommend in conjunction with those tox panels. The gut zoomer, um, the stool test is one of them because if the gut isn't working, you can't detox. So you need to be able to have low inflammation, remove bile around, um, your pH needs to be good. You need to have your really good probiotics. You can't have overgrowth and pathogens. So anytime I really do run a tox panel, I make sure that I run at least a gut zoomer first, because I really need to know what's going on in the gut so that when I am detoxing, I know that we have sufficient microbial status and the gut is working well enough to actually help neutralize those toxins to be able to get rid of them out of the system. Hand in hand and with that goes the micronutrients. And the reason why is micronutrients, especially like our fat soluble vitamins are really important for producing bile and pancreatic lactase, which is essential for removing toxins, heavy metals, viruses, bacteria. We need to make sure that we're absorbing our nutrients. We don't have leaky gut. Um, we're digesting our food properly and we're getting the nutrients that we need. There are certain nutrients like zinc, um, selenium, iron that actually help neutralize heavy metals. So if we're not, if we're deficient in them and we're low, we're not going to actually be able to neutralize those heavy metals too. So those are two, like my core gut zoomer and micronutrients are a very strong core piece for me when I'm doing any type of toxin or getting rid of anything. Um, the weed zoomer with the intestinal permeability, super helpful too. If you have a patient that doesn't want to go the stool route and just wants to do a small piece and just kind of look at what's going on before making that plunge, the intestinal permeability of leaky gut. If you have actin and, and you have some toxins going on, um, maybe you have gluten sensitivity and we really need to remove that. Super helpful. Uh, lastly is the organic acids. The organic acids can play several dual roles as one. It could definitely tell us if we have overgrowth and especially with those aspergillus families that we talked about with the mycotoxins. So we could definitely kind of see what's going on with that. We can make sure we are uh, utilizing our nutrients properly and we don't have any type of metabolic disorder. 
were um, everything with the brain, that gut brain connection. So I love pairing that with the organic acids. Um, I think it complements it very well. So if I could do all these tests together, I definitely do. If I have to pick and choose, I definitely do the total tox bundle and the mic and the gut doomer test. And that would be my nice little uh, bundled piece together. So just taking away some quick key points here before we wrap up and take some questions, um, we want to identify and remove the exposure. It's really, really important, especially for kids, especially for adults. If you're in a mold environment, we need to remove you from that mold environment. If you're con get eating contaminated, drinking contaminated water, we need to make sure that you have a water filtration system. And, you know, so we need to really identify and remove those exposure areas. Not all toxins are created equal. So we really need to make sure that we identify which toxins could be a little bit more severe that we need to focus on. Um, and, you know, I still think all toxins are pretty toxic and we need to remove them all, but let's, you know, some might be worse, especially if you are in contact with black mold, that would be severe versus, you know, a little bit of BPA at first. Um, these tests helps with guide with treatment protocols. Tests don't guess. This is individualized care. And that's what we really want to do is that individualized care for patients. So it actually helps us narrow down exactly what we need. So again, heavy metals, I need to know what heavy metal we're up against so I can, I know exactly what protocol to put my patients on. Detox supplements are not a one size fits all. I get asked this a ton from providers. Um, well, what do you think about this seven day detox or this detox protocol kit? you know, sometimes I think they're okay. And sometimes I think they're a waste of money. So honestly, I, it is not a one size fits all. You should not put all your patients on any type of detox supplement regimen without actually knowing what you're trying to detox. Because again, the individual visuality of these tests is to identify exactly what you're focusing on. And remember to go back to basics before moving forward. So again, Basics is your micronutrients and your gut tests first before you can even think about detoxing the system. Those key parts need to be fully functioning and working. You need to have your liver open and your pathways open, your adrenals open in order for you to detox or else nothing is going to matter. You could detox all day long with supplements and it's just not going to work and it's not going to happen. Just real quick, wanted to let everybody know about the Southeast um, Integrative Summit. This is the first um, Vibrance, first annual um, Southeast uh, Integrative Summit on March 5th, 2022. Um, those who register actually get a complimentary Total Tox Bundle Kit. So it is a win-win. You get to hear some amazing speakers like Jill Carnahan and Christopher Smith talk about some amazing topics, especially mold. Um, if you wanted to dive in a little bit deeper on that, and then you get a complimentary total tox bundle kit, um, which I think is, you know, absolutely amazing. I think everyone should run it on themselves first before running it on a patient just to kind of get perspective of your own health. And, you know, and I think that's, you know, and it was very hard for me to do that. You know, I put everybody else first before myself, but it was nice that I, when I did it, I go, wow, I really need to work on these things because, you know, I need, I want to be here for as long as I can. And I want to decrease that toxic load for myself. So, and we're going to open it up to some questions. Amazing presentation, Greer. Thank you so much for all that. That was just a really good overview of mycotoxins, heavy metals, all these different types of environmental toxins that we experience are in presence of on a daily basis and how important it is, as you've put, to make sure that we're testing these on our patients to really get to the root issues. So thanks again for going over that. Really great job. Yeah. And it looks like we have a number of questions that came in today. So we're going to try to get to as many of these as possible. So let's just jump right in if you're ready for that, Greer. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the first one is, how do you prep for these tests? I know that certain prep is different for different kinds of tests. So can you walk through the prep for each of these tests? Yeah. So the total tax bundle is actually just one 
uh, urine collection. It's the first morning's urine. Um, there typically really isn't a real guideline or specific prep. You can fast for up to 12 hours prior to collection. A lot of times that helps provoke a little bit more mycotoxin, environmental toxins out of the system. Um, the really only other thing with heavy metals is we kind of want to avoid some of the high iodine and selenium foods because they actually have very high binding capabilities. So we do have a really great um, pre-test requirement instructions that we will be um, sent out with everybody when they get a total tox bundle panel. So they will know how to effectively prep for each test if they wanted to, but that is pretty much the gist of a quick, you know, recap of testing, but you will get those specific instructions. There's not too much to avoid for that particular test. Great to know. Great to know. Still adhering to those uh, test preparations is going to get the optimal results. So thanks for going over that really important information. Second question is, you've talked a little bit about provoking today. So can you talk a little bit more? How do you recommend provoking for this test? Yeah. So with heavy metals, um, you know, our test is validated unprovoked for heavy metals. So it, you don't have to provoke. It's practitioner preference. I provoke it's practitioner preference. It's just what I find that works best for me and my patients. Um, with things like mycotoxin, environmental toxins, I might provoke a little bit with that as well. Uh, infrared saunas, you know, you know, sweating, getting the body moving, things like that. So it is practitioner preference, but our test, especially heavy metals, is validated unprovoked. Good to know. Thank you for answering that in depth. And I think that the next question we have here is, is really common. Uh, patients asking, or practitioners asking, if I have a patient high in whole heavy metals, environmental toxins, and, and mycotoxins, where do you really start with the treatment with these types of patients? That's a good question. So again, gut and micronutrients. You have, and and I've dealt with patients that are high on all three levels, and I go right back to my basics first. Is the gut working? Are you getting enough nutrition? Because those things help to neutralize and detox those toxins. So gut and nutrients are first. Typically, I will start working on the ones, again, like if they had black mold or toxic mold, that stachybotrys, I might attack that one pretty quickly um, and start identifying where that was coming from. And then maybe a little bit of the heavy metals and things like that. So. Um, it is, it really does depend on what comes back as high and what is the more problematic um, results. Good to know. That makes sense as well. And then following to that last question, if you have a patient with all these different types of symptoms related to mycotoxin, potentially environmental heavy metals, that overall toxic load, how do you know when to run a total tox panel for those or in general? I run it on everybody. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I, uh, as I said, our world, we come in contact with so many toxins every day, 700,000 toxins per day, per day. That's 255 billion toxins per year. Everyone should be, should, everyone should have a total tox bundle panel. You need to know, you need to know where you stand. Is your body working? Is your system working? Are you detoxing the way you're supposed to? So to me, it really, it's one of the things that I put on and say, listen, if you could do this test and add this on, do it because you will, you will feel better knowing your health versus anything else. Absolutely agree to that. As you've mentioned today, tests don't guess. Lots of toxins in our environment. It's better to know than to guess and, and to get a really good perspective on the root issue. Great, you've done an amazing job today. Thank you so much for the presentation. Really, really good information here. We have one last question for you. Sure. And that is, how long do you do a protocol for and then retest for a patient? Typically, detox protocols are up to about six months. I have had times where I've retested within three months to make sure we are on the right track because again, not everyone detoxes the same, not everyone will respond to the same, a specific protocol. 
So there are times where I retest at three months, but typically any good detox protocol takes at least a good six months. Very good points, Greer, on, on different types of detoxing that each patient does and timing on all that. That's very, very good points that you brought up there. So again, thank you so much, Greer. Big shout out to Greer McGinnis today and Vibrant America for jumping on here today for this today's live class. Just a really, really good background on these different types of testing, both environmental, mycotoxin, and heavy metals. So thank you again. And You're I know welcome. we weren't able to get to everyone's question today, but please reach out to us after this live class if you still need help. And again, if, uh, if you are interested in learning more about Rupa Health and uh, helping how we can help optimize your practice, Adrian Martinez, who is our of practitionership partnerships, is going to put on a live demo right now for you. And so I'm going to have him jump on the, um, the talk here today. So thank you again, Greer and Bye, Vibrant America. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Greer, and appreciate that, Dr. Anthony. My name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. Um, we are the organization who is hosting today's live class as well as the weekly live classes that hopefully some of you have been able to join. Um, for the next, you know, say 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to give a quick rundown of Rupa Health, who we are, what we do, and, you know, basically why we are hosting these classes on a weekly basis. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just so uh, you have something to look at other than my face while I kind of go over this, but Rupa Health is a platform that is designed to alleviate a lot of the pain points that can oftentimes be associated with these lab tests. You know, if, if you are a practitioner who orders from multiple labs, including, you know, Vibrant, for example, Genova, um, really Dutch, you name it, um, I'm assuming that you're familiar with some of those pain points. You know, the first one being, of course, having to have separate accounts for each of those labs just to begin with. It's a lot to, uh, to manage, you know, receiving your results from different places. Um, that alone can take up a lot of time in terms of just tracking and managing the lab ordering process. So what we've done is we've created a platform to alleviate that pain point by uh, bringing on 20 plus labs onto rupahealth.com and allowing you as a practitioner or your staff to be able to order, track, and manage everything in one place. So you'll notice all of the labs up here on the top left, over 20 plus labs in this list isn't final by any means. We're consistently onboarding new labs and providing you and your team with new additional options to order from. Um, you can run filters and searches. So if I'm looking, for example, for heavy metals tests, I can see if I type in that word heavy as a keyword, there's that vibrant wellness test straight away at the top right? Um, I can search by sample type. Um, I can search by if there's a phlebotomy required. So if I'm looking for a, you know, a blood spot versus a full serum draw, I have the ability to filter there. So, you know, the, the first kind of pain point that we're alleviating is the need for you to create multiple accounts with all these different labs. So you need one account with Rupa Health, which is free to sign up for. And you have access to all the labs in one place, as well as the ability to track and manage all your lab work and results in one spot. The second and equally as important, I would say third and equally as important component to Rupa Health is the patient experience. I spend every day speaking to practitioners um, that are ordering labs and really one of the most common pain points that I'm hearing uh, are associated to the patient experience, you know, whether it's spending hours answering uh, the questions that are related to support or even related to uh, how to take the test, um, to coordinating phlebotomy, to just how do I make these tests more accessible to my patients, right? There's a lot that can be associated with the patient experience. And so that's what we've really created this you know, other value proposition for Rupa Health to help alleviate. So as soon as you place that order on Rupa Health, we can effectively take it from there. You're able to um, place that order. We'll send over our own curated FAQs, instructions, videos. We can manage billing directly with the patient. Or of course, you have the option of managing billing with us and then billing, billing the patient outside of Rupa. We'll handle any specimen issues, any support questions they have, right? So really the idea there being, all of those pain points and things that would generally um, you know, require you and your team to spend hours a week on, we'll take that off your shoulders and bring it on to ours. So with that, I'm going to go over a, a quick little demonstration to show you exactly how Rupa works, how easy it is and simple it is to 
do place an order on, on Rupa. I'll walk through the patient experience. And then from there, if we have a couple minutes after, I'm happy to, to stick around for any questions. If not, I'll display my contact information for any of you if you are interested um, to contact me and you know, happy to provide a one-on-one -on -one, uh, demonstration of Rupa Health that might be more applicable to your direct uh, to your direct practice. Now, if you hear any growling in the background, that's just my dog. So I apologize about any background noise there. Uh, maybe they'll pop in and say hi at some point. So what you're looking at here is the main Rupa Health dashboard. The first things that you're seeing here is just how you're tracking and managing all your lab work. I'll show you a little bit more detail on that in a moment, but what I'll show you first is how simple it is to place an order on Rupa Health. To place an order on Rupa, we just need a couple bits of information. Patient's first name, last name, email address. From there, we collect everything else directly from the patient. This thing makes things more streamlined for you and your team, as well as ensures the accuracy of the information. With the order screen, you'll notice at the top that we can create custom bundle, so custom bundle panels, you name it, a combo of any one of those tests from any of our partner labs. That way it's one click, all of those labs ordered in one place. Below that, you have access and the ability to create a favorites list. A favorites list being an individual test that you are commonly ordering. So let's go ahead and say that we wanted to order the uh, heavy metals test from Vibrant Wellness and the uh, mycotoxins, right? Go ahead, it's one click and those tests are added straight away. But let's say maybe I wanna add some complementary tests in there as well, you know, perhaps a, a GI map, uh, one click from uh, Diagnostic Solutions, Again, any one of these labs in one place, one click added directly into your cart over there on the right hand side. If you're looking for a specific test in particular, you of course have access to the entire catalog, which I showed you previously right down below. So again, I can search by company, filter by sample type, search by specific test. You have access to everything in one place. We're having to go to each individual lab portal to order these labs anymore. Once those kits are ordered or added into your heart, if there's an add-on test available, let's say Zonulin, I want to add straight away that over here on the right-hand side. I'm going to go ahead and remove this just so we can keep it clean and uh, just show you how simple it is to order these Vibra Wellness tests since we were just speaking about them. You can schedule tests out in advance. So let's say that you're working with a patient and you want to retest your patient down the line. You have the ability to schedule a test, say, six months down the line, really for whenever. But the idea there is to use our, our platform, use our technology to automate the process for you on your behalf. Mm -hmm. All of the prices that we offer here at Rupa Health from any one of our partner labs are going to be the exact same that you would get going directly to any of the labs as well. So there's no upcharge there. Similarly, those are the same prices that your patients will receive. So let me actually go ahead and click back on to say the SIBO here. A lot of labs offer both a practitioner price as well as a patient price. At Rupa, we are always going to offer that practitioner price. So again, providing you and your patients with the lowest possible costs. The way that we generate our revenue here at Rupa is very straightforward. On each order, there's going to be a 7% processing ordering fee, which will break down very transparently. And that's paid for by whoever is paying for the tests. What that means, as I mentioned previously, we can either bill the patient directly. If that's the case, then they will be the one absorbing the 7% cost. Uh, if you decide to pay for the cost, it will be the ex exact same. It'll default to having the patient pay, but if you decide to pay for the order, as I mentioned, you can do that. You just simply click that box here. If nothing else, it's as easy as clicking send a patient. That's how you order your tests. Now, of course, there's additional details that we can highlight here. I can add notes for the patient. This can be anything, for example, if there's specific instructions, um, let's say that they're taking a supplement regimen that you want them to continue to take, you have that opportunity to place that here. Uh, notes for Rupa is available as well. This could be anything for us. And let's say that you want to add IC codes to allow your patient to submit a super bill to their insurance for reimbursement. You have that ability. We have a full built-in catalog. You just need to type in a keyword. It'll bring up a list of those ICD-10 codes associated to that keyword, and you're able to add them straight away. From there, we'll send over a template to your patient to show them how to create that super bill and submit that to their insurance. So again, we're taking care of that patient experience on that side as well. But again, nothing else. Go ahead and send that directly to the patient. And that's how simple it is to place an order on Rupa Health. 
once you've created that order, it's gonna appear right here in your main screen. This is where you'll be able to track and manage all of your results, all of your orders straight away. You can search by specific patient. You can filter by status of your order. So you'll notice that we'll update the statuses of all your orders. And if you're in a multi-location or rather multi-practitioner clinic, you can have one single clinic set up for multiple practitioners and you can filter by practitioner's orders. So making things more streamlined and efficient in that manner. So you don't have to have multiple accounts for your clinic. You can have one account for your entire clinic, which is great. If I click into one of these in progress orders, let's say I click into this one for Tim Iverson, I'm able to see an update as to what's happening with each one of my orders from each one of my labs, right? So we can see here four different tests, three different labs. I can see when the sample arrived at the lab, what can I expect those results to come in um, so I can stay up to date. Should there be any delays? I'm updated. I'll know exactly what's going on, why it's delayed, as well as we'll update the patient as well. So what that does is allows you to uh, basically have clear communications from each one of the labs without having to go to each portal to understand what's going on, right? Um, at the same time, it'll keep your patient in the know. So they're not going to be having to reach out to you worrying and wondering where their results are at because they'll be notified should there be any results as well. Once your results are in, you'll be notified via email. And from there, you just hop right into your Rupa account. You're able to download the results straight away. These are the exact same results that you'd be receiving directly from the labs, which is great. We're not making any interpretations. We're not you know, uh, making any adjustments or our own version. These are the exact same results that you would be getting from the labs. You'll send the results directly to the patients from Rupa as well. Um, we won't send the results to the patients at all. Um, you have full control over how those results and when the results are sent to your patients. Um, from there, you can schedule a clinical consultation should you need some additional assistance interpreting the results. That's an option here, um, as well you have access to the requisition. Once you've had the opportunity to review these results with your patient, you can update that, um, that status of the order to mark as reviewed so you know exactly where that status of the order is, that it's been reviewed with the patients, um, and from there, you can move on to your next orders. You have also additionally the option to order again. So another kind of version of the retest schedule, you can order directly again from this screen for your patients. So what have we covered so far? Well, a couple of things. We've covered exactly how simple it is to place an order from multiple labs on Rupa, as well as track and manage all your results in one place. The next main feature I'm gonna show you and jump to is the patient experience. Again, this is something that I've heard probably the most pain points coming from a lot of the practitioners we work with is, hey, how can I spend less time managing all of the support and admin work with these tests? That way I can focus on building my business and seeing more patients, right? Um, so this is a feature that really does allow you to do that. So once you place that order on Rupa, we can take it from there. We'll notify the patient that the order has been sent. The kits will be shipped out within 24 hours. We'll send over our own curated FAQs, instructions, oftentimes videos to the patients. We'll check in and follow up with the patient, and then you're notified as the results come in. All this to say that we're leveraging technology to provide an experience that patients as well as practitioners have come to expect in 2021, right? And what this has led to is a patient compliance rate up above 85%. What does that all look like? Well, this is an example of the email that will be sent to your patients should they be the ones paying for the tests. So it'll say something along the lines of, hi, Joshua, Dr. Jordan has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are, and then we'll actually highlight different payment options that we accept here at Rupa Health. So it's not any big secret that these tests are expensive and they oftentimes tend to be cash pay only, right? that creates a pretty big barrier for a lot of patients oftentimes, especially if they're experiencing financial hardships. Well, we can do not only cash or credit here, but we can accept HSA, we can accept FSA, as well as we can set up a three-month interest-free payment plan with patients directly. So these are all extremely popular options, especially that payment plan. Um, and we've seen this you know, provide the ability for many, many patients to have the financial ability to afford these tests. From there, we'll collect all the necessary information to complete the order. Uh, of course, demographic information, shipping information, billing information. We'll highlight the cost of the tests as well as, of course, the tests that were ordered. Nothing is hidden from them. Those same prices that we saw when we were ordering uh, are going to be reflected and broken down directly in the screen as well.
right? The alternative to this would be if you decide to pay for the tests and build a patient outside of our platform, right? And there's a number of reasons why practitioners would want to do this. Um, for example, an interpretation fee, right? Um, at the moment, Rupa Health doesn't allow a practitioner to bake in an additional cost to tests. So for, you know, those types of situations and scenarios, this would be the alternative option to that, right? Um, with that said, nothing changes in terms of the patient experience, okay, other than the fact that they're not paying. So this is what those communications will look like. Very similar, one or rather a couple just major details uh, differences or key differences would be we're not going to show the cost of the tests. And of course, with that, we're not going to collect any billing information from the patient. We'll still highlight the test that was ordered, but we're not going to show the cost of that test, okay? From there, you're notified, or rather the patient is notified once those kits have been shipped out. And a couple days later, we will send out customized FAQs, instructions, and videos with the tests on how to take the tests, how to fill out the requisition forms for each of the tests that were ordered. And if there is a blood draw required, we'll go help the the patient with that coordination of the phlebotomy. We'll do this by sending over options based on the lab that they're working with. Uh, additionally, beyond that, should the patient have any questions on how to take tests, how to fill out the requisition, or even if they want additional options on a blood color on the spot, right? So again, taking that off your shoulders onto ours. Additionally, we'll help with any uh, specimen issues should they arise, right? You'll see an example of our instructions on the right hand side. This is an example of the Dutch complete. So as you can see, very comprehensive, uh, but also very user friendly at the same time. These next couple scrolls are just gonna reiterate what I mentioned, right? So we'll, we'll uh, help coordinate the phlebotomy, walk through requisitions, and then we'll follow up with the patient. Um, so automating follow-ups to the patient, ensuring that they're, uh, everything's going okay. If they have any questions, you know, we'll fill them in. Um, if how, see how their lab tests are going, right? Just simple, quick little surveys to see how everything's going. And then ultimately, you're notified via email as the results come in. So you're able to plan accordingly with your patient on next steps. All this is with the end goal of providing a better experience for everybody involved, right? Not only for the patients involved, but for the clinics and for your you and your team on how to exactly manage all of the lab testing that's happening, right? Um, so with that, those are kind of the three main components of Rupa Health. I'm gonna jump back to this main screen and then highlight a few additional awesome features that Rupa Health provides beyond just the ability to track and manage lab work, uh, but things like Rupa University. Um, everybody still on the call right now, and, and thank you for staying with us here, um, is watching a current Rupa University uh, presentation. So you're able to hop in here, and I apologize, it looks like my internet's running a little bit slow. Uh, the perks of living in a uh, 1908 uh, San Francisco house. Uh, where the walls are, I believe, just made of lead, probably, right? Um, but you have access to these recorded videos, and we host these videos on a weekly basis, right? We just hopped out of this one with Greer here. You can see that we have Dr. Pamela Smith coming up next week. Um, but any previous, you're able to hop in and continue to learn on our platform. Um, beyond just Rupa University, we have a podcast which Dr. Anthony hosts, the Root Cause Medicine podcast. Uh, we have a magazine that we're consistently uh, putting new content at, content into, and you have access to all that just directly within the support center here. Um, support center not only provides support, tutorial videos, but of course things such as the magazine, right? Clicking into the magazine. Here we go. Here's the root cause of illness up at the top and all of these amazing different articles that were written. Um, beyond that, you can customize your settings, you have support lists or, you know, creating clinic staff and inviting your clinic staff, custom bundles, you name it. So think of Rupa Health as more than just a place where you're going to be able to track and manage all your lab work, which, yeah, of course, that is a very primary value proposition for Rupa Health, but it's also a place where you're going to be able to continue to learn, continue to network, um, and, and really just improve as a practitioner. Um, so with that, 
Um, I'm curious if there's any questions. I did see a couple of questions potentially come in, um, but Dr. Anthony, I'm not sure if you want to facilitate that or do this offline. It's around about 12.15 right now. Um, if you have any questions beyond that, if we don't get to them, here's my direct contact information. Again, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships. It's just adrian at rubahealth.com. Very straightforward. That's my direct phone number below as well. So don't hesitate to reach out should you need anything, uh, but that I believe we're at time. Thank you so much, Adrian. Yes, fantastic demonstration. We did receive a number of questions from, uh, from our audience here today regarding the Rupa Health portal and everything. And I would say the best route at this point in time, just because we're having an overwhelming amount of questions here, is to send an email directly to Adrian. You can see his information right there on the screen, adrian at rupahealth.com. Right now, we just have a lot of questions coming through. Great questions, everybody, but almost too many to answer in a short period of time. Um, and so if you can, please direct all questions to adrian at rupahealth.com. Thank you again, Adrian, for this fantastic demo and for everybody jumping on our live class today, and we will see you next week. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Take care.